Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event titled Four Hidden Lifestyle Risks Associated with Dry Eye with Dr. Tracy Dahl. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So I'm super excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Tracy Dahl. Um, there's a little background on her is that she graduated from Pacific in 2006 and then completed a residency at the Portland VA Medical Center following graduation. She then embarked on a teaching career at Pacific and pioneered one of the first ocular surface dryness centers. She has a passion for lecturing, writing, and performing research on ocular surface disease and safe beauty for the eye. And she's a contributor to the upco upcoming TFOS workshop. You've probably heard of a little thing called TFOS <laughs> and serves on the subcommittee for cosmetics. So Dr. Dahl will be able to enlighten us not only on the research, but also real world application for these recommendations in everyday practice. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. These are her financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated. So I will go ahead and have you take it from here. All right. Thank you so much, uh, WE University, for inviting me. I do want to update my bio a little bit. I have been in private practice for about a year and a half, seeing strictly ocular surface dryness and patients with problems with the front of their eyes. So I've done it all from education to lecturing to now private practice, which I love. So I'm with Sunset Eye Clinic in Beaverton, Oregon. So thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I know there's a lot of my past students and a lot of my friends that are on tonight. Um, so big shout out to everybody. And if you haven't met me before, I'm so thrilled that you're here so that I can share a little, little bit of my daily life with you. So what I want to do is get us all on the same page so that we understand why some of these sneaky risk factors I'm talking about are going to be impactful on the ocular surface. The Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society has defined dry eye, and there are a couple of key components which I want to draw your attention to. Number one, multifactorial. I do not have a single patient that is dry for a single reason. It's usually a mixture of reasons. So I might have that perimenopausal woman who's on her computer for 12 hours a day. And it also doesn't close her eyes at night. I might have a 62-year-old male with low testosterone who loves riding his motorcycle on the weekend. So it could be a plethora of things. I'll do a, I'll do a case about a 20-year-old a little bit later. So it really can hit anybody at any time, depending on the risk factors that are at play. And when you do have these risk factors at play, you're going to see that inflammation and neurosensory abnormalities, corneal nerves, are at play and are playing huge etiological roles. So let's go through this little slide because um, I made this to sort of simplify the way that we need to think about ocular surface dryness as an entity. So this is how things really should be working. Um, in the interblink, when your patient opens their eye and tears start to evaporate, that should send some messages, both parasympathetic and motor, to the brain that says, you know, hey, we're kind of running out. We should probably have more tears that ocular surface is starting to feel a little bit dry. That sends a message to the tear glands, all of them, for our basal tears. So we're talking about our lacrimal gland, our meibomian glands, and even our goblet cells. And then you get this beautiful basal tear release onto the front surface of the eye, which should support it. This is how a healthy eye should behave. But then, as I mentioned before, we get this multifactorial desiccating stress that comes into play. So Whatever it is that tips the scales, the eye is no longer operating in a normal functional capacity. It's not just a simple lack of tears. It's there is a distinctive problem, which changes the messages that are sent. We get inflammatory cytokines, which are just cell signalers that send different messages, interrupted messages that we're not we're secreting normal tears anymore. The message that's sent to the brain is we have an inflammatory problem, but we need an inflammatory response. So what's sent to the tear glands instead of regular messages is, hey, let's kick up a T cell, B cell reaction here, which is going to result in inflamed tear glands, which are going to release angry tears that are full of inflammatory cytokines. This is going to cause inflamed ocular surface damage. So when we see SPK on the front surface of the eye, 
that is literally the end of the inflammatory cycle. That's the end of this whole process that's happening. So what you get is these damaged cells, they're apoptotic. We really need to start looking at SPK and punctate epithelial erosions for what they are. It's inflammatory cell death, right? So this is what's happening to our patients. And so it's my job to take a look at that evil desiccating stress that's in the middle of the eye and remove it from my patient's lifestyles. So I've done a lot of a lot of work trying to look at what could potentially harm my patients. And when they're sitting in my chair, if there's something they can control, we are absolutely going to go after that desiccating stress that we can control. Now, there are some known risk factors, which unfortunately really can't be changed. Um, age, those of us who are, you know, past the age of 40 really know that we cannot control that. Um, Sex that you were born with, that's not something that can be changed. That changes the way that hormones work in your body, chemical mediators, um, certain systemic conditions you could just be prone to from genetics. Ocular surgery, might have to have it. If you're going to save your vision, might have to have it. And then, of course, contact lens where this might be something that you need to do um, in order to you know, daily you know, see on the regular. So we may not have as much control over the classic known risk factors as we like. But there are some things that we can do to improve our risk for developing ocular surface dryness and to help calm our patients. So I'm super excited because this is really right around the corner. The hard work is being done. This paper is just being compiled by some pretty amazing writers at this point in time. But the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society, which has brought you dues one and dues two, is going to be releasing a lifestyle epidemic. This is going to be talking about things that we and our patients actually have some control over. So that's coming out. I'm on the cosmetic subcommittee, so I'm really excited to talk about that. That's one of my passions um, in ocular surface dryness is helping people to be both healthy and beautiful, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, all these risk factors have one common thread. So you have to ask yourself, why are these risky? And we'll get to that at the end. You might already know the answer. So let's talk about risk factor number one. I like to call that bad beauty. So bad beauty, it can encompass anything from our regular ocular cosmetics, mascara, eyeshadow and eyeliner, to these complex cosmetic procedures, which are on the rise. Um, unfortunately, these cosmetic procedures are advancing at a rate that isn't keeping up with what we as doctors really know what's happening. So that's why I'm here to give you a window into what's happening and what we can do to improve the situation. So here are the numbers of bad beauty. And I picked these three statistics purposefully to illustrate um, three different points. Um, number one, at this exact moment in the United States, there are only 11 banned substances. That's right. You can put almost anything into a tube, a jar, or a palette. This is contrasted with the over 1,300 banned substances in the European Union. So we really do not have good regulation and control over ingredients in our cosmetics. Literally almost anything can be put in and around the eye. And what we do know is that people are going to use these. This is a survey that happened just right before the pandemic went down, where 44% of women experienced negative feelings when they were not wearing makeup. Um, this has only worsened with the advent of these beautiful screens that we're looking at. So I can look at myself right now on the screen. And I can see all of my flaws while I am working, while I am talking to you. Never in our history have we ever been forced to look in the mirror at work like this. So makeup is not going away despite the use of filters. And here's one number, which is one single enhancement. This is false eyelashes. This is a $1.833 billion industry. That's just one thing that's happening. So we have poor regulation. Everybody wanting to use it and companies making a lot of money off of cosmetics. So we have to learn how to play in the sandbox and help our patients because this is just not going to go away. So as of right now, I want you to be aware there are no federal or local regulations and there are no requirements for FD submission. So once again, anything can go in a bottle, well, except for those 11 substances, which are known carcinogens. I also wanna make you aware that everything that you have ever read on the side of a cosmetic bottle is a marketing term. Because here in the US, we have no standards to which we can hold these terms to. Um, I have to admit, I was fooled. 
And I bet you were too. Hypoallergenic means absolutely nothing in the United States. If you want to go to the European Union, there you actually have to submit safety data on that. Here, nay, nay, not so, not the case. Um, natural, pH balance, clinically proven, doctor recommended. All those sound super nice, but they're really just trying to get you to, to buy a product with absolutely no having to back it up. Um, also, the following terms, while they do have definitions, don't necessarily mean they're any safer than anything else that's out there. So if you've been hit by organic or cruelty-free, those can be wonderful things. They mean a lot to my patients here in the Pacific Northwest. But, you know, organic lemon juice is organic, and it's still not something I'd want to put in the eye. At the end of the day, it comes down to the importance of ingredients. Um, I am happy to say things are changing. So this came out right at the end of 2022 in December. This is called the Modernization of Cosmetic Regulation Act of 2022. And there's some amazing things that are starting. Are we to the European Union level yet? Not quite. But companies are actually going to have to submit their ingredient lists, their cosmetic lists. They're going to have to disclose when they have a serious adverse event. And there are going to be mandatory recalls from the government. So if somebody does get seriously hurt with a cosmetic, there is the ability to pull that off the shelves. Right now, all of those recalls are completely up to the company themselves to do it if they want to. Um, we're also going to take a deeper look at a couple of ingredients that are found to be problematic in, co in cosmetics. And I'll talk to you about those in a minute, mostly being fragrance allergens and then asbestos. That's right, asbestos in your cosmetics. So this is happening. It's moving in the right direction. So what I hope to see is more regulation like this. I know Washington State just, just passed a, a recent law. It is going to be state by state, but I do like to see that we're trying to move into um, better healthy choices for our people. Let's talk about some ingredients that we want to be on the lookout for. Um, these are things that I will run through with my patients if they have ocular surface dryness and make sure that they go through their cosmetic lists, ingredients to see that they, do, that they don't have these in there to cause further irritation. So watch out for the word fragrance. It's considered proprietary. So this is the hallmark of a design for a lot of cosmetics. If it smells a certain way, patients are, or clientele are going to identify with that scent, right? Unfortunately, because it's considered proprietary, somebody could have an allergy to a part of that fragrance and have no idea that what's in there. So this is why Morka is going to, that new law is going to require any out potential allergens that are common to be disclosed in, in accordance with the fragrance. Now, I do know there's a family of fragrances that people tend to have high allergy to that are in, in natural substances. So I'm going to give you a little sneak peek here. This is the Ol family. So if you see that on the side of a jar, if all three of them are there, that could be irritating. One probably by itself is not such an issue, but all three of them together, watch out that for, for a fragrance. And they tend to have more of a citrusy smell which is unfortunate because that is my happy smell. Um, preservatives are things to watch out for. We have to have them in cosmetics so that bugs don't grow, so that we don't get you know, bacterial contamination. Um, but there are some that are more irritating than others. Probably we're all familiar with benzoconium chloride or BAK. Well, it's not just in eye drops, it's actually in cosmetics as well. So if you have a patient with a BAK allergy to drops, they may have zero idea that that's in their cosmetics. We also have formaldehyde and formaldehyde derivatives. Um, you may think of formaldehyde, that's like your eyeball floating in a jar, cadaver preservatives. So it's a pretty tough one. Um, it's been known to not only kill what's in the cosmetics, but also kill what's on the ocular surface. It can be cytotoxic to corneal and epithelial cells. Parabens are known to have that same effect. Um, also watch out for the combination of ethyl hexoglycerin and phenoxyethanol. Each of those on their own does a pretty good job killing, but when you add them together, the effect is additive. They potentiate each other. So it's not one plus one equals two. It's much stronger than that. So one or the other, when they're in combination together, if you see that, they better be the last two ingredients in the jar or it's, it's too high of concentration. And then of course, metallic pigments and glitters. We don't do glitter. We do beautiful matte natural colors at my clinic. Uh, these have iron oxides in them. They have metallic particles that can flake off and cause micro abrasions. These, this glitter can come off, scratch the front surface of a contact lens, actually change the contact lens parameters that research has been done. 
And we want to make sure that we stay away from bright, brilliant colors. The more brilliant it is, um, it's probably not for an ocular surface dryness patient. So if it could occur on a tropical bird, it's probably not for my patient size. Um, a couple other things to be aware of, talc and mica are being looked at very closely because talc and mica can oftentimes be contaminated with asbestos. So these grow in the same place where they're being mined. So it can be very difficult to separate one from the other during the collection process as we're looking at trying to get the talc. A lot of times it is contaminated, can be contaminated with asbestos. If a company is not doing the proper um, electron microscopy check to make sure that they're not growing there together. So that's why the U.S. is starting to look um, deeper into this, because as we know, asbestos is a no-no for our health, including being carcinogenic. It was found about three or four years ago in Kitty Cosmetics by a very popular pop star at the time who had her name associated with it. It wasn't a mandatory recall because we don't have such a thing, but um, she did recall it out of the um, off the market herself. Um, watch for emollients and bases because we want to make sure we don't take thick oily substances and draw them right over the top of our meibomian glands. So things that contain you know, petroleums, latex, lanolins, resins, that's a recipe for meibomian gland dysfunction when we draw that over uh, the top of the meibomian glands. Um, certain emulsifiers can be more irritating than others. I'm not a big fan of stearic acid. And then nylon and mascara. Watch for nylon. This is that popular um, nylon fiber trend where you can see somebody growing and growing and growing lashes. Those are prone to flaking off. They can get into the ocular surface. They can embed in the front of the, in, into the front of the conjunctiva. So we want to stay away from fiber lashes if possible for our ocular surface dryness patients. Um, which brings me to the lash obsession, I suppose. You're just talking about mascara. Somebody did the research, friends. Someone did it. In 2015, they took a look at humans and mammals and tried to decide, you know, what is the optimum lash length? How long should lashes actually be? And the answer in humans and mammals is simply that the eyelashes need to be one third the eye width. So if you have bigger eyelashes, eyes, you should have larger eyelashes. Yes. So that is why a giraffe has ridiculously long eyelashes. But should a human's lashes be as long as a giraffe? No, because they actually serve an anatomical function of getting debris away from the front surface of the eye. So when you alter that ratio, you could be creating a wind tunnel right to the front surface of the eye. Which brings me to probably the one thing I'm most passionate about. And I like to talk to a lot of healthcare providers about this. Before we start recommending lash augmentation, and profiting off of this trend, we have to ask ourselves, are we supporting what is healthiest for the ocular surface? If we're recommending altering this ratio, could this have potential problems with the ocular surface? My dry eye patients should never have a wind tunnel to the front of the eye. So we're looking for thicker lashes. So everyone's seen this one, right? Let's go here so I can get this one to play. All right. <laughs> Anyone have this patient? Yep. Um, so this would be a case where we have these beautiful lashes that are, you know, giraffe lashes. This is not really helping this patient in the situation where the wind is going. So we want to make sure that we are keeping lashes at typical lengths. So what are some different ways that people are elongating their lashes? Well, I'm going to bring this one to your attention because while those Ridiculously long fake lashes are easy to spot. This one may not be quite as easy. So during the pandemic, I did a little project, a little survey project where I surveyed 154 individuals who had used over-the-counter eyelash growth serums. So probably starting around the mid-2000s, I can remember being my residency at the time, we started to notice that some of our glaucoma patients at the VA where I was at we're starting to grow these ridiculously long lashes, these little old men with very long, luscious, beautiful lashes. Or they'd come in with really weird, stumpy ones because they literally cut their lashes so they could wear their glasses. This effect was absolutely jumped on by pharma. And they prescribed a, and they made a prescription version that you could take a bimatoprost and rub it along the lash line 
and get lashes to grow, which was great for people with a history of alopecia or trichotillomania and some other issues. Now, the thing about a prescriptive version is all of those side effects have to be listed on the packaging because it's a prescriptive drug. So the beauty industry did not want to be outdone by a pharma company. So they started coming up with their own synthetic versions and selling them over the counter. Where the problem happens with this is that the consumer may not be aware that these practically identical to a prescription version of lash growth serum could have the same potential side effects. And because it's a cosmetic, they are not legally mandated to write down all of those potential side effects that could occur. So right now we have consumers that are out there buying over-the-counter eyelash growth serums with prostaglandin analogs that don't know the risks that they could potentially be taking. So I took a look, I did the study and it was really interesting. And maybe people self-selected on this because they'd had problems, but 43% of individuals stopped using the cosmetic. That's really weird. Like most people who start using a cosmetic keep using it over time. They don't completely dump it. Um, and the top reason listed for stopping using it was side effects followed by the cost because a bottle of this eyelash growth serum can cost roughly about a hundred bucks. So it's expensive with the potential for side effects that are identical to the one that's being sold over the counter. You won't see this as a doctor because it doesn't look like anything. It's clear fluid. So the way that I tell, I tell doctors to look for this is if you have a patient with abnormally long eyelashes that are exceeding that one third ratio, spidery, wiry, and their conjunctiva is bright red, ask, because they won't tell you. They're not getting this from you. They're getting this over the counter. They're getting it from their multi-level marketing scheme friends. They're buying it online. They're getting it from their hairstylist. They can literally get this anywhere. This is not allowed in the European Union, but it's widespread here in the United States. And every single one, every single one of them does the same thing. There's not a single company. And I've looked at the ingredients for literally all of them, and they're practically identical. So there is no safe amount of prostaglandin that can't cause side effects with certain individuals. So be aware, if you see this, you want to, well, I'll give you an alternative option for patients later. The second part of this trend is um, synthetic lashes. We can't grow them, let's stick them on. And fake lashes are what we use at home. Those are used with adhesives or magnets and glues. The eyelash extensions are put on by a lash technician, usually in a salon, and they are gluing one lash at a time, one lash at a time with the glue pot to the existing lash. This is a very tedious process that takes a couple of hours, and this has to be redone every two to four weeks to keep those long lashes looking healthy. The complications with this are what you would expect. Um, the glues have some pretty nasty substances in that people can be allergic to, um, formaldehyde, latex. I find that patients sometimes also think that they shouldn't wash their lashes because they're trying to get them to last longer. This is not like a pair of jeans, folks. These have to be regularly cleaned and maintained so that you don't get this infective side effects like dermatitis, chalazia hordeolum, and blepharitis. So you will know if somebody has fake eyelashes because that will be easy to see and that will be easy to see behind your cell lamp. The next modification may not be quite as easy to see because this is a chemical modification. People are out there and they are firming and tinting their lashes with the same stuff, chemically identical, that you would put on as hair dye or firming solution. These things contain hydrogen peroxide, thioglycolic acid, and ammonia. That's right, near the eye. So they're oftentimes done together in a salon. The best way to identify if a patient has done this is you'll see blonde patients who have like the first part of their lashes by the root are normal blonde, and the second half looks pink. And then there's the fun with the anti-aging. <laughs> So retinols. So there is a topical called trentinoin. It's a stronger form of retinol that when you rub it into the skin becomes chemically identical to what happens with Accutane. If you take oral Accutane, that is known to dry up my bombing glands, shrink up those sebaceous glands. So patients taking trentinoin would probably have, have the potential for the similar issues with their my 
So knowing what I know that the stronger version can cause issues, while there is no data on this yet, I do want to see someone do this data. Um, I would like to see what weaker retinols do. So I take, I don't have any of my personal um, patients on retinols around the eyes because I just don't know. I know that the stronger one can cause problems. So I don't want them doing retinols near the eye. We can use something else. I'm a huge fan of hyaluronic acid and vitamin C. We also have to be careful about the Botox in a jar or Arjuline. Um, this is, I can have the same side effects as over Botoxing the crow's feet. If you over rub that in, that can actually make it so you cannot blink normally causing exposure issues. So be careful about the Botox in a jar. So we're wrapping up this section real quick. This is my favorite one, but we'll get to the next ones. Um, you're looking for ingredient checking websites that can get you started, get your patient started. There's a couple up there. I have no proprietary interest in those. It's just places I send people. And then of course, if you're gonna use healthier cosmetics that don't have the super strong preservatives in them, it's important to replace them regularly so you don't get bacterial contamination. The powders every six to nine months, liquids every three to four months. If you don't like wasting products, I recommend getting sample sizes or some of them will actually have packaging that you can replace it with it. So it's not as wasteful. So you can get like an insert instead for like a shadow. So I recommend replacing cosmetics that way. I think fake eyelashes and eyelash extensions should be only for special occasion use. If we're altering that ratio, that's a recipe for chronic irritation, right? And what happens when we have chronic irritation? That's another risk factor for kicking us into that dry eye cycle. So for special occasions only with trained individuals, no eyelash extension in your cousin Susie's basement, super bad idea. And make sure that you ask if you go to a professional salon for safer ingredients. They will do non-formaldehyde glues at your local lash lounges. They will. I say avoid chemical alteration at any cost. Um, I'm not a fan of lens of, of tints and lifts because once that chemical does its damage, it's done. There's no going back. There are prostaglandin-free lash growth serums. These ones tend to have polypeptides in them. They promote lat, like thicker, healthier lashes versus forcing elongation. Um, and then, of course, replacing your retinol or argiline with a vitamin C or hyaluronic acid or an in-office procedure is probably a healthier idea. I could really talk for like an hour on cosmetics, but I do want to get to our other risk factors. So um, let's talk about the next one, which is super interesting because this one's caught me a couple of times with my younger patients. This is vaping. So this was a great idea. This came from a good place. The, one of the first e-cigarettes that was actually made out of China was by a businessman whose father died of lung cancer, and he was scared because he was addicted to cigarettes himself. He was trying to come up with an alternative to help people be healthier. Um, so what this is, is the nicotine or a substance of choice. It could be THC, um, could be cannabinoids. That's popular here in Oregon. These are put into a liquid, which is then heated up with a metal coil. And then that results in a puff of vapor that is then inhaled instead of smoke, okay? The intensity of how strong the nicotine is going to be all depends on the voltage or the, of the battery. How strong is the battery getting that um, coil to heat up and release the nicotine in the, in the e-juice into vapor? What's interesting is the original ones looked like cigarettes, but once I show you this, friends, you will never ever be able to unsee this. Um, nowadays, vaping mods do not look like your classic e-cigarettes. They are not even called e-cigarettes, it's called vaping now. The newest generation looks like pens, USB drives, AirPods. So the next time you're sitting in an airport, if you see somebody putting a USB stick up to their mouth, it's not a USB stick. This is what they're doing. It's really discreet, it's easy to hide, and a lot of them don't have a very strong scent. So this is a way to get a nicotine hit in public without a lot of people noticing. Like cosmetics, there's very little regulation on e-juice or what's, what's it's being dissolved in. There's 80 different chemicals that have been identified in e-liquid. The main ingredients are going to be a solvent of some type. Um, propylene glycol is very often used and glycerin. You have to have some kind of solvent because 
Water vapor alone with nicotine is very peppery. It would burn on the back of the throat. So people would not be wanting to enjoy that, would not be purchasing that if it felt like pepper spray on the back of their throat. So solvents are being used along with the active drug of choice, again, being nicotine um, or cannabinoids. So here's a list of all of the things that could be in your e-juice. We've got carbonyl compounds, we've got VOCs, heavy metals. So when that coil heats up, some of that metal actually can leach into the e-juice. They've actually found heavy metals and regular metals like nickel, tin, and chromium in e-juice. And then people are inhaling this into their lungs. They're exhaling and guess where that vapor is going? Um, vitamin E was used for a while as a solvent, but it's been identified with um, a condition called EVOLI, which is basically like pneumonia without an effective agent. It comes down to vaping. There's carcinogens in here. There's irritants. There's all sorts of problems with what could be an e-juice because it's not really regulated. So when patients exhale this, it's really no surprise that this is going to ha have the potential to disrupt the tear film. Um, formaldehyde <laughs> is just like our cosmetics is also in e-juice. So we know formaldehyde in cosmetics is irritating. It's also irritating if you were to exhale it and have the vapor go into your eyes. Um, there are papers that have shown it increases free radicals over the ocular surface. It reduces your tear breakup time. And this is thought to occur because it disrupts the lipid layer of the tear film. So if I have patients that are vaping and they have dry eye, we have to talk about alternatives for them. Can't talk about vaping without the serious danger or risk. Um, the pods and mods should never be, should never be altered. If you've got a current that doesn't match the battery that could result in an explosion. And there have been documented cases of mechanical injury and, um, burns and foreign bodies. People have lost eyes over this. So got to say that even though it's not a dry eye thing. So... The reason that we should be asking our patients who are dry in their mid-20s if they're vaping is this. This was the original marketing that came out for vaping. Who on earth do we think this kind of marketing is targeted towards? There are now states, including mine in Oregon, that have laws against this. You cannot market this way. Um, so you will find a lot of mid 20 somethings because they started in their teens who are now addicted to vaping because that nicotine, what they thought was just tasting like cotton candy vapor actually had nicotine in it. There's a lot of individuals who are addicted because in their, in their, in their mid twenties because of this. So let's talk about healthier recommendations. You have to ask about vaping in addition to smoking. Vaping is water vapor that, you know, in some states is allowed to taste like chocolate milk. So people do not associate this with something disgusting and weird like smoking. Oh, I would never smoke, but they will vape. So it's an important question to ask, particularly when you have a younger person who's experiencing dry eye issues. I always educate never to alter adapt equipment if I find out I have a vapor. And if it's associated with dryness, I'll encourage the patient to try another way to get nicotine. There's gum, there's patches. Here's a great site to go to, um, drugwatch.com, that helps to get people away from vaping. So here's a quick patient case that I was caught in. I had a 20-something that was referred to me for Accutane, um, my, my pography problems. So my bone gland dysfunction from Accutane use. So I got him calmed down with intense pulse light, did gland expression with, um, with vector thermal pulsation. He was doing awesome. We had him on a chronic topical anti-inflammatory therapy and he came in for a follow-up and he was like, Dr. Dahl, I think I messed everything up. I had too much fun over the weekend. And I was like, oh, what's too much fun look like? And he told me that he had been gaming with his friends and they were vaping. And he was concerned that maybe that the vaping had, um, had done something. At this point, of course, I was embarrassed. I should have known better. Did I ask him about smoking on his case history? I sure did. But vaping is not smoking. So he didn't tell me until this point 
Um, at which point I was like, yes, yes, yes. That is the reason why you feel bad right now. You need to quit and you need to do something else recreationally for fun. So I put him on a topical steroid, got him calmed back down. He came back in, he was super excited. And he says to me, Dr. Dahl, I have no more problems with vaping. And I was like, oh, great, you quit. And he said, no. <laughs> I put on my friends that have problems. Not the exact solution we were looking for for the rest of his health, but keeping the vape, vaping solution out of his eyes definitely helped to keep everything under control. My point is you don't know, just like cosmetics, you don't. All right, another thing that people can be very addicted to, screens, that's right. Um, children right now are spending an average of six hours daily on computerized devices, phones, laptops. Teens are up to nine hours. Um, prior to COVID, only 32% of patients said that their children need screens for more and more hours a day. Um, during COVID, that number increased to 62% because everyone was on screens. Adults, um, today, you probably looked at your smartphone for three to four hours, or you will be before you go to bed. We know poor symptomatology is correlated with screen use. Um, and then I had some friends who worked with the Amish, who did a great paper at the Academy a couple of years ago, and they showed, comparing us to the Amish, that really it only takes two hours to be dry. So we have a mismatch in what we're doing as um, for careers, culturally, in school, to what our eyes can actually tolerate. There's that nice grid talking about prior to COVID and after COVID, and then how hours of screen time we're using. So why is that? Well, we're trying to fight evaporative issues. Normally in conversation, we're talking about, we're taking a blink about 26 times per minute. Um, normal resting, 17 to 23, depending which study you look at. But when we read and look at computerized devices, that drops down to 4.5 um, to 10 times per minute. That's over half a reduction. People are just staring with their eyes open. And I've watched this happen over time as when I was in education, starting with out computers, watching students transition to computers, just not closing their eyes. So why is blinking important? We have to resurface our tears. That interblink, it's like forcing people to do tear breakup times over and over again throughout the day. You actually have to close your eyes to stimulate mybum release. So we're just not getting our eyes closed enough as a society. It's, you know, it's, it's like everyone's walking around with their eyes like the walking dead and it closes it anymore. If you, this is a nice schematic of how tears are spread across the eyes. So if you physically do not blink, tears do not get spread across the eye. Healthy tear film should stay stable through a series of seven blinks. If you're not even blinking seven times, that's not going to happen. So reduced blink rate is going to turn into evaporative or desiccating stress, which is the recipe for dry eye. We know a lack of blinking is positively associated with meibomian glands and dry eye problems. So it's absolutely important with your dry patients to have that conversation about screen time because it really superly is impactful. Can't talk about screens without talking about blue light. The data out there is kind of at this point, we do know that it, ca it can cause some damage in mice, um, but we really don't have any evidence to date about correlating this with dry eye. Chicken or the egg, could blue light cause problems with our circadian rhythm and cause us to not sleep as well? well? That could be a problem because we'll talk about sleep next. So, I tell my patients if they feel more comfortable wearing something that blocks the blue light, that's fine. Um, probably need a little bit of blue light in the morning just to keep our circadian rhythms going. But at nighttime, the data is just kind of mad on this topic. So how do I help my patients combat their screen time? Um, the 2020 rule is great. That's something that if you already know it's already in your brain, that's great. I'm closer to 10 minutes. Take a break, close your eyes for five seconds. Um, improve case history. Don't forget to blink. I love to have patients add who are computer users to add humidifiers to their workstations, turn off ceiling fans. And there's actually a moisture chamber eyewear that can be ordered that doesn't look terrible. It's not like people have to wear goggles anymore. So check out 7 Eye by Pan Optics. I do not consult for them. I just like to recommend their eyewear. It's actually not unattractive.
So here's some recommendations for screen time and how we can improve that for our patients who tend to be dry because pretty much all of us are on the computer are right now. Are you blinking? You just did, right? Okay. All right, our last risk factor. This is poor sleep. So we talked a little bit about those poor circadian rhythms that sometimes can get kicked in if we're overly using our computers, you know, with sleep and whatnot. Um, so what we know about poor sleep is it's been positively associated with decreased aqueous tear production. We know it alters the, the corneal epithelium has shown changes. Um, it's more, it's sensitivity is more apoptotic. There's changes in the normal morphology of it. We know that sleep disorders can cause this and that's in animal models. Um, but poor sleep definitely is gonna cause patients to actually physically feel worse too. This is one that gets overlooked a lot. And this is one that I overlooked a lot. Um, this is one risk factor that may not be able to be fixed for patients, but it is something that we can help them with their life, with their risk sleeping style to improve. This is obstructive sleep apnea. Um, there's a couple of problems with having sleep apnea. Number one, when you don't get enough oxygen into the body, that actually creates a hypoxic state which is known to increase inflammation. The other thing about sleep apnea is there's a positive association with floppy eyelid syndrome. So anytime I get a patient with a history of sleep apnea, I go in and I pull down their lower lids, watch how it snaps back, and I pull up their upper lids. And I also do the core blocky lid seal test we'll talk about in a minute. And I see how those lids are moving. If they're flopping and all over the place, and they're not closing and snapping back quickly. Sleep apnea is a, could possibly be a connective tissue disorder as, and that connective tissue is very similar to the tarsal plate in the eyelids. So there might be a connection there. And then of course we have the use of um, CPAPs to get the patients to breathe. So if you have patients on a CPAP, oftentimes even the best fitting CPAP will leak at times and that can leak into the eyes. So there are great solutions now that we have to help those patients have a better night So how do you check for an inadequate lid seal? How do you find out if your patient is sleeping with their eyes open? This is a nighttime behavior and it may not be one that we can totally control, but it's something I wanted to include on this talk because it is a lifestyle. It's a life that you are living at night. So who gets inadequate lid seals? Well, we talked about block the eyelid. Ooh, close blepharoplasty. That's a choice for a lot of patients to get blepharoplasties for cosmesis reasons. You take a little too much or even in the healing process when that lid is tight, you know, that, that, that uh, scar tissue is tight, there might be a gap. Or it could be an anatomical variance. I remember when I was at the university and a, I saw a set of triplets and nobody could figure out why they kept having dry eye problems. They were 15. Guess what it was? They slept with their eyes open, all three of them. It was just an anatomical variant. So this is the core blackie um, lid seal test or light test. And you only need one tool and you have it in your office already. Good news, not having to buy anything new for dry eye. This is a transluminator pen light. You turn the lights off in the room, you gently set the pen light on there and you look for light escaping. If there's light escaping, that means that air can go in. So you have a patient that has potential for exposure while they're sleeping. So this is how you find the inadequate lid seal. And how do we help patients have better nightlife? There's a couple of different options on the market. Um, I'm starting using this new one. I've had such great results. I will admit to you that I do consult for this company. This is called the Sleep Tight Sleep Right Shields. They're stickers that are fenestrated, so they breathe, and they help that lid stay shut from top to bottom and front to back. This works really great with those CPAP machines that we were talking about because it's not another cumbersome, heavy mask. It's something that just sticks right there. It takes, it takes about a week or so for patients to figure out the right orientation on those, but they do work incredibly well. Um, gels and ointments can still be used. If you have a patient, I have some patients who are like, yeah, stickers are not going to work for me. I am too claustrophobic. Good luck. I also have some patients who just pull them off in the middle of the night. They don't even know they're doing it. Um, so gels and ointments can be great options. There are ointments now with vitamin A, which helps to heal the cornea as well. Um, masks are great, especially with people who cannot get rid of their overhead fans. I have a lot of people who the partner that they're sleeping with needs to have a fan on 
And so sleep, them sleeping with a mask will help to deter um, extra airflow into their eyes. And then at a very <laughs> minimum, you've got somebody that literally cannot afford anything. The saran wrap trick works great. Little tiny piece of saran wrap, you put a gel in, you tap that saran wrap in there. They can put a smaller strip and tie it around their head or put a mask over the top. Saran wrap was what I was using before sleep tights. Um, can come loose a little bit easier, but it also, it's also good for patients that don't do um, adhesives. So there's some tips and tricks on helping patients have better a better night because sleep does matter. We also know that there is a mental component to sleep. So when people don't sleep, that tends to increase anxiety and depression. We absolutely have the data that shows that anxiety and depression worsen dry eye symptoms. So you can have two identical patients. If one of them has depression, worsening depression or anxiety compared to the other one, their dry eye will feel worse. So it's important for patients to have healthy, comfortable, complete sleep at night as that will be a contributor to dryness. So what do all of these risk factors have in common? Well, they all have the potential for to kick up inflammation on the ocular surface. With our cosmetics, it's literal, you know, it's literal ingredients that can be pro-inflammatory and pro-allergenic. With our e with our e juice um, and vaping, it's again literal ingredients and chemicals that can cause ocular surface irritation. And chronic irritation with that day in, day out, year after year after year. If you're looking for for a research project, I would say in, in, in you know, 10 years down the road, if you're looking for a project, I would start taking a look at all of the people who wore unhealthy cosmetics day in and day out. I think this last trend is going to make it so that I will never not have a job because this is chronic inflammation day in and day out. Um, the other risk factors that we have, screen time. I can be the best dry eye doctor in the world. I can get an eye clean. I can get it calmed down. But if it's not protected, if I'm fighting exposure, that chronic exposure leads to inflammation, right? So it's important for us as computer users. It's important for us, for our children. It's important for us, for our careers to take breaks. There is break time software that's usually installed on all the major tech companies in my area. And I know this. I also know that a lot of these tech guys think they're going to be a lot more, and women, I think they're going to be a lot more efficient if they take it off and make them put it back on. We have to take breaks. Our eyes are not meant to look at screens all day long, every day at risk of that inflammatory process happening. And we also know that if we have exposed eyes at night, so we've got the exposure with computers during the day, exposure with eyes not closing at night, that is going to kick up inflammation. You cannot have chronic exposure without the risk of developing an inflammatory response to that. So all of these behaviors, poor cosmetics, vaping, screen time, and the last one, which is poor sleep, are going to affect our patients. So my case history is going to include questions on all of those factors when I'm doing a dry eye evaluation because I have to know what the modern risk factors are and what it is that I am fighting. So I'm going to, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. I can see the chat box is just on fire. So I'm going to give my thank yous and then we're going to go ahead and take some questions. So I would love to thank the original dry eye divas that when I started getting interested in, Hey, what is in cosmetics? They really helped me. And I was able to bring this great information out to the West coast. So I'm excited that West Coast, East Coast, um, South, everybody has someone that's good with, with cosmetics. I'm thankful to the Tearful Monocular Surface Society for the work that they've done, for the doctors all across the globe who are going to help to tell us how we can help our patients. I'd like to thank Dr. Vin Dang, who has done a lifestyle lecture with me before. He helped a little bit with the screen time slides, so I'm going to give him a shout out there. And I'd like to thank Wu University for giving me such a great platform to come and share with you tonight. So. Are there any questions? If you don't feel like the chat box is for you, um, here is my email. It's drdollies at sunseteyeclinic.com. 
You can also slide into my DMs on Instagram at drdollies.sec. So that's where we're at. All right, let's get some of those good questions. Perfect. All right, well, we would like to thank you for that amazing presentation.